Okay, great. So um, I'm really happy to present our speaker of tonight's presentation, who is Kim Ryle Woolcock, speaking on It's Tough to be Tiny and her beautiful children's book. So Kim is a biologist turned science writer and editor. She has a bachelor's in English literature from UBC and a master's in biology from Duke University. As an editor, she helps scientists tell other scientists about their research. She also writes science books to inspire kids. She loves telling stories about tiny tardigrades, neurotoxin shooting nudibranchs, and the amazing invisible workings of the world. Kim is the author of It's Tough to be Tiny, illustrated by Stacy Thomas, and the co-author of Design Like Nature, Biomimicry for a Healthy Planet. She has lived in a van and on a sailboat, and now she lives on Salt Spring Island with her family in a house they built with their own hands. So um, a warm welcome to you, Kim. I'm going to stop sharing, and then you can um, start to share your screen. Thank you, Stephanie, for the warm welcome. Thank you for inviting me to talk to your group. I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, give me a moment as I share my screen. There we go. Can everyone see my slides and hear me? Looks great. Yep. Okay. Looks great. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really glad to be here today to tell you about It's Tough to be Tiny, my book about micro beasts. Um, I'm talking to you from Salt Spring, so I am grateful to be living within the ancestral and unceded lands of the Hulkaminum and Sankotan speaking peoples. Um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about It's Tough to be Tiny, which is about the amazing world of micro beasts, which are very small creatures with amazing superpowers. Some of them can shoot goo out of nozzles on their face. Others wear glitter as a disguise. Some even keep glowing bacteria in their belly to help them hide from predators. Today, I'll tell you a little bit about the process of making It's Tough to be Tiny, read to you about the awesome superpowers of a few of these creatures, and then at the end, I can answer any questions that you might have. So before I start talking about the book, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. This is me as a child. I'm about eight here. Um, and when I was a kid, I loved to read. You could always find me with a book. I was so intense about it. I read through our local library from top to bottom and back to the top again. I think my parents took me there like a million times, maybe two million. It was a lot. And all that reading made me curious about a lot of things. And when I went to university, I became fascinated by plants and decided to become a botanist. So lucky me, that meant I got to go into the woods, collect plants, bring them back to the lab, extract their DNA and analyze it to try to understand how they were related to each other and build like a family tree for them. And I studied mosses in particular. So here's a picture of one of my favorite ones. It's called Grimia pulvinita, and it lives near here, usually on rocks or on walls. And it grows in these little soft cushions. And on the left, there's a photo of a single moss plant taken out of one of those cushions and put under the microscope. And when I give this talk in person, I usually at this point ask for a show of hands. <laughs> who know who knew that moss, mosses look like this under the microscope? Um, and it, it's a bit different this time because I can't see anybody's hands. And it the answer might also be different for this group than it usually is. Normally, no or maybe one person will raise their hand. They find this very surprising. Um, Anyway, I think that this shows what you can see when you take the time to look close. Sometimes you can see things that are very surprising to you. And sometimes you might even see something that no one has ever seen before. 
So all this time that I was becoming a scientist and enjoying doing science, I also secretly wanted to become a writer. So I filled journal after journal and book after book. I was writing notes, ideas, stories, even novels. These are just some of my journals and they're completely full. And that doesn't count all the, all the stories on my hard drive. It, um, it takes a lot of practice to become a writer. And so while I was practicing, I was lucky to manage to combine my love of science and my love of words, and I became a science editor, which I love because I get to keep reading new science all the time and also working with words. And I'm helping to improve the accessibility of research around the world, which is important to me. So eventually I did, after all that practice, become a published children's book author. And It's Tough to be Tiny is my second published book. My other book, Design Like Nature, is about the science of copying nature called biomimicry. So, for example, researchers are studying mosquito mouth parts to improve design of needles for giving injections because um, the way mosquito mouth parts are shaped helps you to not feel when mosquitoes biting you. And wouldn't it be nice if you couldn't feel when you were getting a COVID shot? I would love that. Um, another example is that engineers are shaping the fronts of high-speed trains like kingfisher beaks so that they are able to go through tunnels without creating sonic booms that disturb wildlife. So that's enough about me, and now I'll move on to talking about the book. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about the journey of It's Tough to be Tiny from idea to published book. And I have to start by saying that this book was not my idea. Um, but I love the way that it came to be. And so it, it reminds me that it's important to be open to opportunities. And so I'll tell you how it happened. It all started at the library, because really that's where all the good things begin. And I had finished drafting the biomimicry book and I was thinking about what my next book would be. I had a manuscript about fungi that I was ready to send to publishers. So I was there looking at all the kids science books to see which publishers were doing kids science books and which ones I liked the most to identify the ones that I wanted to send my manuscript to. And I found this one, Bonkers About Beetles by Owen Davey and published by Flying Eye. And I just thought it was, it was wonderful. I completely fell in love with it. I thought it had beautiful design and solid science, and it was just super engaging. So I thought to myself, I really want to work with this publisher. And so I sent them my manuscript about fungi. And this was just before the pandemic in about December of 2019. And a few months later, because publishing is really, really slow, uh, they wrote back and said, no, they didn't want to do a book about fungi. but they quite liked my writing and they wondered if I would write a book about micro beasts for them. And so as a picture book author, you usually write a book, workshop it, really prepare it. You know what it is, you know what it's about, you know you love it before you try to sell it. And so for me to write a book on proposal like this, especially as a newer author was a little bit nerve wracking. Um, but they also, with their question, sent me a few photos of microbeasts, and I was completely won over uh, by these tiny creatures. So I did a little more research, and I decided that, yes, indeed, I did want to write a book about microbeasts. I thought it would be fantastic. So I went ahead and I took the leap. And the next step, of course, was research and tons of it. So I knew that it would be a book about small creatures. That was basically the only uh, the only thing that Flying Eye uh, stipulated. And um, so I didn't know anything else about it. I didn't know which small creatures it would be about or what about them it would be about. So I started by making a list of tiny creatures that I knew about, like Daphnia and tardigrades and springtails and rotifers and lepidoptera. And I knew that I really wanted to feature creatures that most people maybe hadn't heard very much about. 
I wanted to include a wide range of taxa and not just to focus on one group of organisms. I wanted to be able to include things like diatoms and hydra and stentor because most people don't know about very much about them and they are so cool. So I didn't really know what I was looking for here. I was just following a spark of curiosity and being open to what I might find. So I did a lot of research and I wrote down every creature I came across without being too picky. Yet. And then these decisions, of course, are always influenced by who you are. And growing up, I skipped grade two. And so I was always by far the shortest person in my class. I was guaranteed to lose games of pick in the middle. I couldn't really play basketball and I just always felt small, you know? Um, and then in sixth grade, I had a friend named Heidi who was very tall and she gave me a sweatshirt that said in glittery letters, tiny but tough. And this became my motto. It's probably still my motto if we're honest. Um, and I started to see this theme of tiny but tough emerging in the creatures that I was looking at. I was finding tiny creatures with incredible abilities like jump so powerful they needed gears on their legs to control them or the ability to build their own armor that doubled as an invisibility cloak or hiding in piles of their own poo or shooting goo out of nozzles on their face, or hunting with an itty bitty sticky yo-yo. And once I found these creatures, I knew what the big idea of the book would be. And so I read a whole ton of science papers and I also watched a lot of funny creature videos on the internet. And this part was probably one of my favorite parts because I was discovering weird and wonderful things. Um, I also want to say, I feel like, and maybe, again, maybe this is not true for this audience, but I feel like science papers have this reputation of being dry and boring, but they can be really exciting and full of fun pictures and weird creatures and crazy things like blindfolds for spiders. Like, who knew? So uh, there are lots of them on the internet, and I encourage you to go check them out. Okay, so now I knew my big idea and I had done my creature research and I had a draft. So it was time for revising and fact checking. And the revising was just that, you know, making the huge pile of words sound better, moving things around. Revising usually takes a lot longer than writing and it's kind of boring. So I won't actually say much more about that except that it took a long time. Um, but here I was also checking facts with scientists, and this part was amazing. I had approached a lot of researchers to verify that I had gotten things right, and they were so generous in sharing their time and their knowledge. And even better, they often gave me little tidbits that I wouldn't have found in the science papers, like the specifics of how with velvet worms the prey actually helps in its own capture because its struggles need the slime like bread dough and help it harden. Or that the ants that fend off elephants from acacia trees actually climb up their noses and bite them there. And so all these little tidbits that I was gathering during this phase made the book just that much better. So when my editor thought it was ready, she sent it away to the illustrator. And this, of course, is when the magic happened. This is when it stopped looking like a Word document and started looking like a book. And I didn't get any choice in who the illustrator was. And that's how it usually works in the picture book world. Um, the editor and the marketing team will choose the illustrator. And lucky for me, they picked someone completely amazing, Stacy Thomas. I had imagined, you know, in my writerly way, the book as each creature alone in the middle of a white page with, you know, a blob of words nearby, probably in like Times New Roman 12.5. And luckily for everyone, Stacy had a completely different vision of how it would be. And she made it so much more engaging by showing each creature in its environment um, and showing the predators or prey that made the superpowers important. Like in this, in this spread, um, 
you see, can see the little bug hiding in a pile of its own poo. And you can also see the terrifying wheel bug looming over it, trying to find it to eat it. Um, and so it just puts everything in, in context. These, of course, are the uh, rough illustrations. And so she did the entire book in this way so that the design team could check it out and we could do all of our fact checking and all the little yellow stickies are things that we were checking to make sure everything was accurate. And once they were finalized, she went ahead and colored them. And then there was a, another couple rounds of checking and then it was time to send it off to the printer and it was done. So all in all, I sent the publisher my fungus book in December of 2019 and it's tough to be tiny came out in September of 2022. So it took a little bit less than three years, which is a fairly common timeline for a picture book from what I've heard. Um, I wanted to say a couple of, just a quick thing about ideas in case there are any pre-published writers out there. There are a lot of things to learn about writing and this one was especially important for me and confusion about this stopped me from writing for a long time. So when I was a kid, I, I mentioned that I always wanted to be a writer, but when I sat down to write, I wasn't sure what to write about. You know, I didn't have any fully formed novels lying around in my head waiting to be typed out. And so I thought that this meant that I didn't have any ideas. And I thought that meant that I couldn't be a writer. So I stopped trying for a long time. And when I was much older, I heard a writer talk about her idea notebook. And she said that ideas are tiny things that are quite difficult to see. And so she watched for them. And when she noticed one, she would write it down in her idea book. And that writing them down in her idea book helped her to get more ideas because she was paying attention. And this was a real light bulb moment for me. I was like, oh, is that how it works? I had no idea. So I got a notebook and I dug around in my brain. And sure enough, I did have a couple of little bits and scraps in there that looked like they might possibly be ideas. So I wrote them down and I stuck them together and I worked on them and they turned into books. And the more I wrote them down, the more ideas I had. And it's it's sort of like training your eye. It's like when you go out in the field and you're looking for a new type of organism, maybe it's the first time you've gone out butterfly counting or something. And it's it's hard to see them at first, but the more of them you see, the better at seeing them you get. And I, I feel like ideas are the same way. Um, oh, there's one more important thing about the idea book. There are no rules. I write down every single idea before I can wonder if it's good or bad. And I have to decide later if I like it or not. And I think that that makes it easier for more ideas to show up this incredibly low bar. Okay, enough about writing process. It is time to meet the creatures. So I'm sure you can all imagine that if you are the size of a pencil sharpener or maybe even microscopic, life might be a little tougher for you than it is as a human sized creature. Lots of creatures might want to eat you or might just smush you without even noticing. But as I was doing my research, I noticed that a lot of these creatures have superpowers that help them to stay safe or hunt for their lunch or buddy up with bigger creatures for the benefit of both. Some of these adaptations are super gross, like this horseman tortoise beetle on the left that's carrying around a club made of its own poo to swing at its attackers. And some of them are beautiful, like the praying mantis that's disguised as an orchid flower so that it can eat any insects that visit it to try to pollinate it. The book has glitter and gross because nature is both. And I'm going to tell you six examples, two about staying safe, two about hunting, and two about buddying up with a bigger creature. So the first one I'm going to read to you about is the Asian jewel beetle. And its superpower is glitter camo. Okay. The brighter, the better. The Asian jewel beetle hides with beauty. 
Its body shimmers, reflecting many colors that change with the light. They are so bright. Are they really hiding? It seems like a terrible idea for a small insect to wear a glittery rainbow shell. But the sparkly sheen helps these beetles hide in shiny green leaves. The shifting colors act like the different blocks of color in camo fabric, making it harder to spot the outline of the beetle. Okay, here's another about staying safe, the water scavenger beetle. I just, I love the expression that Stacy gave to this guy. <laughs> he just looks so like startled. Um, and it's hard to choose favorites, but if I had to pick a favorite, it would probably be this one. Okay, its superpower is escape. And if you do get eaten, what then? If you're a water scavenger beetle, you just walk right out the back door. Just round black dots. These beetles don't look all that special, but they are actually escape artists. They are so small, a frog can down one in a single gulp, and you'd think that would be the end of them. But no, if they find themselves inside a frog, they just use their legs and escape the frog's innards. When they get to the back door, which is the frog's butt, the frog poops them out. It would normally take more than a day for the frog to digest its dinner, but these beetles escape in just a few minutes alive. Okay, now I'll tell you about some small sized hunters and we'll start with the velvet worm, which has a superpower of a goo gun. Velvet worms have soft bodies that are full of liquid, like walking water balloons. They don't have a hard shell or even any bones, but they are deadly hunters. They sneak up on their prey at night and shoot them with sticky goo using two nozzles on their face. The goo nozzles wiggle back and forth like a garden hose at full blast that no one's holding onto, and the goo splatters everywhere and then hardens into a cage of tough threads trapping the prey. The struggling prey makes the goo harden into stiff threads by stretching it, similar to how kneading bread dough transforms it from a sticky lump to a stretchy dough. Once the prey is trapped, the velvet worm bites it to inject inner melting enzymes and then it drinks the prey milkshake. Okay, on to the next hunter, which is dragonfly nymphs, and their superpower is a loaded lip. So dragonfly nymphs grow up underwater. They hide in the pebbles and plants at the bottom of the pond, when a tasty fish or frog swims by, they don't have to jump out to catch it because they wear a spear gun on their face. They shoot out a special lip that's half as long as their body to grab it and just bring it back to their mouth. It shoots out too fast to see in just a few milliseconds and the prey don't even know what hit them. Okay, and now I have two examples about buddying up and the first one is boxer crabs, which have the superpower of punching with pom-poms. Boxer crabs carry an anemone in each claw. The anemones are armed with nematocysts, tiny toxin-tipped harpoons, so any attacker gets a stinging surprise. With these deadly pom-poms, tiny boxer crabs can fend off bigger predators with powerful punches. The anemones in their claws deliver a painful sting. Boxer crabs also use the anemones to gather food, waving them around to sting small creatures and then bringing the food-loaded gloves to their mouths to feed. The crabs control how much the anemones eat, keeping them small on purpose so they don't get too big to carry. Okay, and the final example of tiny superpowered buddies is ants, 
with the superpower of swarming. Ants versus elephants. Elephants roam the plains of Kenya and they like to eat acacia trees. To avoid being destroyed by their tearing trunks, the whistling thorn acacia has made powerful friends, ants. These tiny bodyguards protect these trees against the largest herbivore on the planet. The acacia's branches are covered in thorns with round hollow bases about the size of a ping pong ball. Ants bore holes in the thorn bases and make them into cozy homes. The acacia also feeds the ants drops of sweet nectar made by special glands near the leaves. In return, the ants defend the tree. When an elephant wraps its trunk around a branch, a swarm of ants attacks, biting the inside of the elephant's nose. The elephant quickly learns not to eat whistling thorn acacias. Okay, that is the last of the creatures. And then I wanted to end here with a little, um, a possible activity. So if there are any kids in the audience, I wanted to tell you about a, a fun activity that you might want to try. Or maybe there are parents or teachers out there who might tell kids about this activity later. So I've read to you about these six creatures and their superpowers. And I wonder if maybe you're inspired to draw yourself with one of these superpowers that I mentioned. Which one would you choose? Or you might sketch one of the creatures, or you might make up your own superpower and a creature to wield it. Um, when I do this activity in schools, I bring a comic panel page, just a page with six squares on it, and kids can use it to draw creatures and their superpowers. Or sometimes they even make a mini comic showing what might happen one day if they discovered that they had one of these superpowers. And in case anyone needs a gift for the young naturalists in their lives, I know that It's Tough to be Tiny is for sale at Boland's and Monroe's. I called both of them and made sure that they had copies in stock. Um, or if you don't live close to those bookstores, I put my website here and it has links where you can find the book online if you would like to do so. And that's it. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Kim. That was amazing. Um, I, I have a question for you. Um, so it sounds like you visit school groups or classrooms. Yeah, I do. Do you do that just um, in person or do you do virtual? I do both. You do both? Okay, that's good to know. Um, I think I would choose having the anemone pom-poms. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's a good one to choose. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I've never heard about that. That's pretty amazing. Um, so what do the anemones think about this? What do they get out of that other than getting battered? Um. It's not clear how one-sided that partnership is. The anemones are not found without the crabs in nature, but when scientists have taken them away from the crabs and grown them in a tank, they get much, much larger than they do when they're carried by a crab. Um, but the crabs are also not found without the anemones. So possibly the crabs help the anemones find food or maybe protect them in some way, but I, I haven't seen any any evidence for uh, the benefit that the crabs provide to the anemones. Interesting. Um, well, I um, encourage um, anybody who has questions to put them in the in the chat or feel free to to unmute and ask them um, yourselves and feel free to also turn on on your cameras if you would like. And then here, I should probably stop sharing my screen and then we'll be able to see the chat better and see more people's faces. Lots of accolades in the chat as well. Aw, thank you everyone.
I see more people are choosing the crab with the pom poms. I think. <laughs> I think we should have a vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> can do your little reaction hand raising oh another crab <laughs> all right i i also um really love um the way you describe the superpowers um like for example the the dragonfly larva i've always you know read about it or heard of it as like this extendable lower jaw or lip or whatever i guess it's a lip but yeah, I love it. It's very visual. <laughs> the way you describe it, what was it? A loaded lip? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so amazing. Oh, that's okay. great. Thank you. So we've got one vote for the dragonfly nymph. <laughs> um, here's a question for you. Did you have a lot of creatures that you couldn't feature? Um, I My list did end up being longer than would fit in the book and then once I decided to organize it into sections I think I had more hunters than I could fit in so yeah it, it did end up there were some very tough decisions made and and creatures left in in my notes and not in the book <laughs> Any anyone that you want to highlight here to give them some uh, <laughs> their their moment in the spotlight? <laughs> um, yeah, you know tardigrades. Mm -hmm. I have a real soft spot for those guys, and they were on my initial list and at every stage until the final stage. And then I decided that you know a lot of people had heard about them and they got gently shoved aside to make room for somebody else lesser known so i was really pleased um i i did put hydra and stentor in the book and i wasn't sure if the editor was going to ask me to take those out as you know too unfamiliar and um too microscopic or i don't know just like too nerdy but I was really, really pleased when they let me keep those in, so. That's great. Um, a couple other things that have come up in the chat. Kim, you'll be pleased to know that the speaker in April will be presenting on tardigrades. Ooh, okay, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Someone here would also like to know the name of the glitter superpower creature. Oh, oh it yeah. was the beetle. Yeah, it's the Asian jewel beetle. Yeah. And if you go to my website, I have a resources page and on it, I included links or names of a lot of the science papers that were part of the research for the book. So if you want to know, like, a lot more about any of these creatures, you can go there and, and find it. Oops, you just got muted just right at the very end there, but oh, I, I'm back. yeah, it didn't <laughs> cut you off too much. Okay. okay, that's great that you have that on your website that I think that'll be really interesting for folks here to get dig into the science as well. Um, I'm curious also about the jewel beetle, because um, I know about emerald ash borers being an invasive species, um, but maybe that's a, a different, unrelated, um, very colorful, glittery Asian uh, jewel-like beetle. Yeah, they are not the same so far as I know. I do not, I can't give you more details about their relationship off the cuff. So. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of colorful, beautiful, uh, glittery insects that are unrelated. Um, another question, do you have an idea about your next book? I have several ideas about my next books, Mary Rose. Hi, Mary Rose. Um, I'm working, I really enjoy writing about plants. And so I have a couple of ideas that I'm working on that are about plants. And then I have another one that's about uh, weird ways that animals sleep. And I've also started to write scripts for graphic novels. And so I'm working on one that's kind of a 
an optimistic post-apocalyptic Jack and the Beanstalk. So we'll see where that goes. Do you think you'll continue working with the same publisher or are they just not into plants? <laughs> I would love to work with Flying Eye again. Um, we don't have a contract for another book at the moment, but I hope that we do in the future. And they definitely do books about plants. So, okay. Just not fungi. Just not fungi, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> but there have been a lot of other great kids books that have come out about fungi just in the past couple of years. I feel like that's sort of a hot topic right now. So we'll see. Maybe I'll try to shop my fungus book around again. <laughs> Um, can we please have the website again? You Many bet. thanks. We'll be watching again with my grand bubs. <laughs> That's great. Um, maybe you could just put it in the chat there, Kim? Yeah, I just popped it in the chat. Great. Um, any other any other questions or um, about writing process or creatures? Um, I'm 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 interested in how it all works with um, you know, just why publishing companies choose their own illustrator. Like, if you could, you decide you wanted to work again with Stacy, or is that out of your hands? That's out of my hands, unfortunately. Um, and I think that it makes a lot of sense because I feel that the publisher knows a lot more about the market than I do. And so they can often have a very good sense of, um, they also know a lot more illustrators than I do. So they have this, this large pool that they can choose from. And I think often pick the, the perfect person to match with your words to make something that is a, a more marketable product than, than I would create as, as discussed with me, like, putting the creatures in the middle of a white page with Times New Roman nearby. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't have been quite as as uh, great of a look. Good. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, any other questions, feel free before we um, all go and look at your website, Kim the rest of this evening. Um, yeah, so thank you again so much for your um, really fantastic presentation. Um, I am definitely going to spread the word about your, your book and purchase copies. And um, I'm also really going to share with my teacher contacts your information about presentations, because I think that's a great um, to get the author there and and to talk about that. It sounds like you do a really fantastic show for, for students as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It has really been a pleasure to talk to this group tonight. I loved hearing all the uh, Natural History Society news at the beginning. And thank you for the reminder about the Christmas bird count. I am going to join. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right, everyone. I hope you all have a really um, relaxing and wonderful healthy happy holiday season with friends and family you can get out in some beautiful places in nature and hope to see you in in the new year thanks so much thanks everyone